Proclamation of Faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. It's numbered 881 in the back of your hymnals. Let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to turn to your worship bulletin to the prayer confession printed there. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. God of deep, scandalous, boundary-breaking love, forgive our closed doors, forgive our closed eyes and ears, forgive our insulated living, forgive our safe and comfortable tables, Guide us in letting go of our need for control so that we can be surprised by the gift of your grace. Amen. And hear the good news this morning. Christ died for us while we're yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Old Testament reading is Genesis chapter 18, beginning with the first verse. And the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks in, of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men stood in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from this tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, I have found favor in your sight. Do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and test yourselves under the tree while I fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham read to the, ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring, and your, Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? 
the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? As the, at the appointed time, I will return to you in the spring, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, happy Father's Day. You can wish that to me. You've beaten my children to it, but uh, they'll get oh, eventually. And it's such an interesting day, right? I've been taking selfies of fathers with their children this morning. That's been great fun. For some people, it's a hard day. They have uh, fractured relationships or they're grieving the loss of a dad or whatever. I got a uh, text this morning, by the way, from one of our young families, uh, Nathan and Anna Givens. Uh, they're spending Father's Day with their uh, newborn son, Stafford. He's in pretty critical condition over at the Levine Children's Hospital. You want to keep them in your prayers. Uh, thinking this morning about uh, all these great passages in the Bible where amazing things happen under trees, right? The uh, story begins, Adam and Eve, they, they eat the apple under the tree. Jesus dies beneath the cross of Jesus. We look up at the tree. It's that great story uh, that I preached on a number of years back in Haiti. It's the one where um, uh, Nathaniel sees Jesus and, 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 and he's surprised because Jesus seems to know him already. He says, I, I saw you standing under the tree. I, I preached on this in Haiti because uh, at the compound there amongst the buildings, there's this big tree where people gather in the shade, and it's a wonderful place. It's a banyan tree. And in preaching, I thought, I I'm going to connect with my people by preaching in Haitian Creole, at least the first two sentences, so not beyond that. They had a translator for the rest of the sermon, but I'm going to start in Creole just so they'll see I'm one of them. So I launched into my first two sentences of the sermon in the best Haitian Creole that I had been coached into. My translator across the way, when I finished it, he looked over at me and he said, what did you say? <laughs> that wasn't going well. This is a story about something amazing that happens under the trees, under the oaks of Mamre. Abraham is there and three strangers show up, and it's interesting. They don't ask him for hospitality. He asks them if he can show them hospitality, right? Like, he is the instigator. He wants to show hospitality. He's the patron saint of hospitality. Uh, he washes their feet, reminds of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. He tells Sarah to go bake some cakes, and unless you think it's like a gender complication, <laughs> From the ancient world, Abraham himself goes out and fetches curds and milk and kills a fatted calf. Again, we're thinking again of Jesus' story of the prodigal son who comes home, throws a great party for him. This whole business of hospitality, you know, we teach children, don't talk to strangers, but when you're grown up, it's like don't cross the street. When you're grown up, you can cross the street. When you're grown up, you can talk to strangers. Huge need in our society for hospitality to people that are different. It's just some curiosity. Instead of judging other people, getting to know other people, there's a theological dimension to it, right? Hebrews chapter 13 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Or Jesus speaks of welcoming the stranger, and he says, He who receives you receives me. Things that happen under the trees. Uh, Abraham, he was older than a grandfather. Sometimes on Father's Day, I, I wound up skipping a generation. I, I think about my grandfather. Uh, he lived in a town called Oakborough in the front yard of his house. There was this fabulous oak tree. I assumed the town had been named for his oak tree. That made good sense to me as a child. And I think of the things that happened under the tree. We'd always gather there with my cousins. I remember my, we were doing this, uh, there was this construction project. Papa Hal was adding a garage on the end of the house. And so there was all, all this stuff in the front yard. He warned me, like, don't, don't play in the front yard. Well, I immediately ran out to play in the front yard. Fell down, a, a nail splintered into my knee. I'm wailing, screaming bloody murder. He comes out. I think he's going to do like what you expect, right? Which is like, I told you not to play. No, no, no. He just scooped me up, hugged me, wiped away my tears, cleaned up my knee. It was great. I've told some of you another time, uh, just in a mood to reminisce a little. Told you another time, 
I was five or six years old, and Papa Howell loved to churn ice cream. Those of you young don't know what this is, but once upon a time we made ice cream in a churn. You turn this handle. So he told Mama Howell to you know, prepare some peaches and ice and the sugar and everything else and the salt. And so he sat down in the chair there, and he began to churn the ice. And then he looked up, and he said, James, come here. You're the first grandson, the bearer of the family name. Ooh. He said, come help me. So I sat down on his lap on that chair, and he said, turn, turn that handle. So I put my hand on it, and that was hard. <laughs> and he laid his hand on mine, and then it began to go, and we turned it, turned it. He was whispering in my ear the whole time. Great job. It's a great job. You know, I, I, I think God's like that. God is our Father. God's like that. You don't, you don't see God, and you're doing something that's hard, but, but God's with you, and you can't really tell after a while, is, is, is that me? Is that God? God's whispering words of encouragement in our ears. Abraham is out under the shade of the oak trees at uh, Mamre. The three strangers come up, and they have crazy news. They say that Abraham will be a father. He's the least likely father in the history of humanity. He's, like, older than a great-grandfather, even. <laughs> And Sarah is of similar age. It's, it's laughable. It's ridiculous. And when they hear it, they laugh. The Hebrew word yatsak, they laugh. Abraham laughs, then Sarah's eavesdropping from the tent. She laughs. And that word yatsak is interesting. It doesn't mean laugh like you laugh at a joke that's funny. It's a laugh that means, as Robert Alter, scholar at Yale, put it, it is disbelief edged with bitterness. Do you know that kind of laugh? It's disbelief edged with bitterness. Like something good's going to happen. <laughs> <You> just <laughs> Abraham and Sarah laughed. Hmm? They laughed. What one of the strangers comes back with is a question. And the question is, is anything too hard for the Lord? I don't know about you, when I live my life, when I'm in church, I do okay, right? But when I live my life day by day, I begin to believe there are a great many things that are too hard for the Lord. Like, I kind of believe abstractly that God can do all things, but when I'm actually going through my life, I start to go, I don't know, that's probably too hard even for the Lord, and I don't know what it may be for you. It may be you're just an anxious person, and you're just saddled with it, and you're just going to be anxious. Or maybe your family is dysfunctional or broken, or there are relationships that just gnaw at your gut, and it just, se it just seems hopeless. Or just your situation in life, or your job, or you know, whatever, will anything be better? You know, uh, this interesting, uh, this week, uh, Elisa Lassiter Weilu, she used to be one of our associates here, great pastor, wonderful preacher. She's now the pastor of Capitol Hill United Methodist Church in Washington, and she called me this week and said, what am I going to say on Sunday? I said, talk about that. Now, we heard about the shooting in Washington, and we're all rattled by that. Oh, this is a shooting in Washington. For her, she has people in her church this morning right now who were on that field when the shootings happened. She has people in her church who work with the congressman who's been battling for his life the last few days. So she knew all that, but then later what she learned, her husband Chris came home, and they'd identified the shooter, and, and Chris says to her, he says, I know that guy. I, I've, I've seen him at the Y. The very day before, he had stood at a sink in the Y, and this guy that he now recognizes the shooter was shaving. Chris is here. You know, and we hear this kind of thing, and... I don't, know, I don't know how you parse it. You know, some people want to say, oh, bad Democrats, or other people want to say, oh, bad Republicans, or oh, bad president, or oh, great president, or oh, bad Congress. Whatever it is that we want to say, all of these are wrong. What ails us is that we're, we're not the people that we need to be. We're the people who have created a world where there's so much anger, there's so much tension, and sometimes it just breaks loose in horrific ways. Can't blame one person. If you got rid of that one shooter, the world would be fine. If you just had a different president, the world would be fine. I don't think so. We are a broken people, and we tend to just get used to it. Like, oh, that's just kind of who we are. I'll harden up and just kind of be on with my people and hope the other guys lose. That's kind of all we know how to do anymore. It's pathetic. And the question is, can we be better people? And the question then is, is anything too hard for the Lord? On our own, we really can't do any better. We've proved that over and over. But is anything too hard for the Lord? 
I mean, God can do anything. God can even heal people like us. God can even heal people like us. I love it that on this Father's Day, we come to the Lord's table. If you have good memories of a dad, it's probably, you can probably go back to a time, a place, when you were at table, you broke bread, you laughed, told a story. You missed that. Jesus knows we have a hankering in our heart for that. And Jesus, Jesus invites us to a table. He says to us that God is our Father and that we, no matter what has happened, we are at home with him. And there is nothing that we face that is too hard for the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the grace of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us, both now and forevermore.
Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we'd, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.